Let's take our Bibles for our time of scripture reading and commentary and turn to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea was raised up to prophesy in those years leading up to God raising up the Assyrian nation to come down and take away. And from that point forward, the 10 tribes of Israel would exist no more. These are the tribes that followed after Jeroboam and went and established a new religion of idolatry, worshiping the golden calf. And that's what they worshiped. In fact, he doubled down and established two golden calves. And that's the way that nation lived under the various kings that were raised up. They were called the Northern Kingdom, or as I've said, anywhere in Scripture where you read Israel from Solomon forward, Israel represented those northern tribes, or sometimes called Ephraim, because that was one of the tribes that was the ringleader in leading all the rest away from the place of worship that God had established to be there in Jerusalem. And I know people say, well, what difference does a place make? It makes every difference if God has ordained that it's in that place that his name be worshiped like so many today. What difference does it matter where you go to worship? It's just important that you just be in worship. Well, that's not what the scriptures teach. If it's not a place where God has established his name there to the glory and honor of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's false worship. And those that have that mindset and just go anywhere are just as guilty as these here that God had given over to their own reprobate mind. So we're coming down. Hosea was raised up during this period that we're studying about in the Kings. This very period, some 20 some years left before the Lord would bring and raise up those Assyrians and come down and take these captives. And so wherever there is judgment in scripture or condemnation looming, we find there's always a message of hope. There's a message directing sinners back to the Lord. That's what's called the general call of the gospel. There are those that are called when they hear the gospel, but they're not they don't come unless the Lord gives them ears to hear. And so here we, we have an example of this call. Come and let us return to the Lord. You notice that this is the word that the Lord gave to Hosea. And he's including himself. He, he's not above the people. No preacher is. The call is for preacher and people together to return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. There are those that the Lord does smite with judgments and brings them low as a nation and a people, not necessarily to destroy them, but in his time to raise them up. And so here's a call for these to turn back to the Lord. Who will turn? Who will return? Well, it's those that he graciously draws by his mercy and in his grace. And it says, after two days, verse two, will he revive us? And the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. I don't know how you can read verse two and not think of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, where the Lord said that they would crucify him and put him to death. Those were wicked people. God delivered his son into the hands of wicked men. And he himself said, just like the sign of Jonah in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, the son of man would be in the earth and then the Lord would raise him up. I see here a forward look at how is it that the Lord has purposed that sinners be revived and brought back again unto him? Well, 
It's through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything here, as far as these days were concerned, are representative of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby he was torn. When he goes back up there in verse 6, for he hath torn and he will heal us. Think of how our Lord Jesus Christ as the substitute was torn and stricken, smitten. See those words in Isaiah 53? Exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ himself endured for the sake of that people that God has purposed to save and he has gloriously saved and raised them up on the third day. In the third day, he will raise us up. He's not just speaking of a temporal raising up because we know that as far as that nation of Israel was concerned, God had purposed their total destruction. But the hope of any that were the Lord's, even in this day, though they should perish, yet when Christ would come, he would raise them up with him. And, and so we shall, what does it say? Live in his sight. That's the blessed state of any that the Lord for whom he has paid the debt and uh, he was smitten, stricken and smitten. We esteem him not, but God did. Though those for whom he died were ignorant of exactly what he was accomplishing, yet in time, by his spirit, God is pleased to deal with them in mercy. So there's the connection between come and let us return unto the Lord. Who will return? Those that God has purpose should return. Those for whom Christ was smitten and those that for whom Christ was raised again that third day. And so we live in his sight. We live, life is in him. And that life is forever. It says, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. There again we see the confidence and hope that those have for whom Christ has paid the debt. will know, that word know speaks of confidence. We have a good hope in him. I notice if there is in italic, but the expression is, as we follow on to know the Lord. We've been known of him, and as he by his spirit teaches us, we do follow on to know him even more gloriously than when he was first revealed in us. And we do that through the scriptures. And the early and latter rains speak of how God in his time blesses us to know him and assures that what he has planted indeed does grow and bears fruit unto his glory and honor. I love that picture there in verses one through three. But now we come back again to the hardened ones that are not only in Israel, because even though Hosea was raised up to prophesy primarily to those 10 tribes of the north, yet it does not exclude Judah. We know God had purposed to preserve Judah and Benjamin, those tribes of the south, because it would be through Judah that God would cause his son to come. But here he addresses both, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? There's none that when they see God's judgments on any other nation or people, they can stand aside indifferently and not know that unless they're the Lord's, they stand just as guilty as any other. That's how you know somebody's been taught of the Lord because they're not pointing the finger out there to, oh, look at all those reprobates and those condemned people. They understand that this word addresses them and but for the Lord's mercy, but for the Lord's grace, so go I. It says here, your goodness is as a morning cloud. 
and as the early dew, it goeth away. So whether Israel, the ten tribes of the north, or Judah, the two of the south, any supposed goodness that they think they have, any supposed faithfulness, if we're just faithful to the Lord, he's going to bless. That's how people speak. But clearly, here it speaks of any supposed goodness that man thinks that he has is nothing but a morning dew. It looks like it is something while it's lying on the ground, but it give it a little sun, rising, it's gone. And that's how we are. There's none righteous, no, not one. Any sort of supposed righteousness that anybody thinks they have, they're fooling themselves. There's no righteousness before God. And so this is why the Lord, through Hosea, gives this prophecy. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. The message of God when he raises up prophets, or in our day even preachers, isn't necessarily for the salvation of a people. Here he says, I have hewed them by the prophets. But what was the message that these had to declare? It was a message of condemnation. It's like the gospel, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, it glorifies Christ not only as a savior, but it glorifies him as judge. Whereby in John chapter 17, he thanks the Father, he glorifies the Father. In that prayer before he went to the cross, a high priestly prayer that the Father had given him authority over all flesh. That word authority means to rule, exercise judgment as he will, but to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. And so here's the judgment part. Any that hear this message of Christ and are left to themselves, and do not glorify him. He says, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. There's a message of condemnation. As Paul spoke of, a savor of death unto death that goes forth with the preaching of the gospel. And thy judgments are as the light that goes forth. It's a light not for salvation, but a light for condemnation, like John said. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, but Men have loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the Lord says there, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. This was what our Lord cited to the Pharisees in his day who were proud of their self-righteous works. And they had condescending attitude toward the people that they ruled over. They ruled in their own pompous, self-righteous thoughts of themselves. And here's where the Lord said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. When he's talking about that, even here in Hosea's day, people were going through the rituals of bringing sacrifices and offering them unto the Lord as if that was going to be their salvation. And he says, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. In other words, they were going through the routines. They were bringing the sacrifices. They were making offerings unto God without any knowledge of Him. It's like some of the hymns we sing that are sung in other congregations. People will stand and say the words. You ever watch them and wonder? I wonder if they have any understanding of who God is and all of His sovereignty and glory and what the sacrifices represented. That, he's represent the very work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet people are about promoting themselves, all the while pretending, professing to be worshipers of God, when, like Paul said in Romans 10, they have a zeal but not according to knowledge. But they going about to establish their own righteousness are not submitted unto the righteousness of God. Who is the righteousness of God but the Lord Jesus Christ himself? So it's not about offering up acts of worship. That's what Cain did. He offered up the fruit of his hands, but it wasn't what God required. And then in his attitude, condemned Abel because God approved of Abel and his sacrifice, but disapproved of Cain. So that's why he says, I desire mercy, 
It's just to say here that where the Lord has taught any one of his own, they understand God's mercy. They're like that public in the temple that dare not even look heavenward and uh, beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He was looking to Christ for mercy. That same Pharisee that was in there, he thought he was bringing a sacrifice unto God, but showed no mercy, especially in how he looked down his nose at this publican. The scriptures say that the publican went to his house justified rather than the other. Justified in, in what sense? In, in how the Lord had caused him to worship and offering, burnt offerings, but not according to the knowledge of God. Not seen in those offerings how um, that depicts the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there were many religious people in this day. In fact, that was their false assurance. They thought, well, as long as we have the temple, as long as we continue to offer our sacrifices, and in this sense, they had a temple, but it wasn't in Jerusalem. This was there in Samaria. They sought to imitate as closely as they could what God had ordained there in Jerusalem, and yet it was false worship. And that's why it says there in verse 7, they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There's only one covenant whereby God has accepted and approved of sinners, and that's the covenant of his grace. That's the covenant that he established with his son from before time. And there's only one way that any are saved in that covenant, and that's through the, the meeting, that's through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says they have, there have they dealt treacherously against me. People find this astounding that in their way of worship, God is transgressed against because it's not how he said they should come. The Lord God has his eye on one person when it comes to worship, and that's his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us even here could be accepted and have any peace were it not for the one who is the mediator of that covenant, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of salvation is done between the Father and the Son. And so he names here, particularly Gilead, that is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood, polluted by their sacrifices, that polluted by the perversion of those sacrifices that these continued brain. This was a, a city that the God had established initially for true worship, and yet now was wholly given over to idolatry. And so he says, and as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests, notice that, who he addresses here, these very priests that were established as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet they're the very ones that he describes as murderers in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. Any so-called minister of the Lord that does not declare Christ alone and his person and work and sacrifice for the redemption for the sanctification for the justification of sinners is a murderer. They're assassins of men's souls. And uh, there are plenty of those today. If we had today people going around and we're spreading some kind of virus purposely to contaminate people, they'd be arrested immediately. And yet, in the name of religion, you think about what goes on in the name of religion, and yet people think it's a good thing. It might be in their eyes, but unless they are truly pointing sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ, like John the Baptist, behold the Lamb, then they're murderers in the way, by consent. In other words, they do it willingly, knowing that it's for their own game that they do it, and so they commit lewdness. That's what lewdness is 
adultery, it's fornication. People look on them as being men of God, and yet by their very message and by those that follow them, they're committing lewdness. And that's why he says in verse 10, I've seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. What's he call it? There is whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Again, what's at stake? What's the issue here? It's false worship. And so he's already declaring here why it is he's going to condemn and wipe out this nation of Israel, the 10 tribes of the north. It's because of their idolatry. There are many people that consider themselves moral and upright by their own endeavors and their own works and how they built themselves up as being children of God and yet they stand condemned before a holy God because it's not in Christ. They're not in Christ. They're following after their works, which is what whoredom is. And so the Lord again warns not just Israel, but Judah also, O Judah, he has set an harvest for thee when I return the captivity of my people. Well, that harvest that was appointed for them would be when the people that were the lords that would be taken into captivity by the Babylonians. That would take place 100 years later. So first of all, he warns Ephraim, they would be destroyed for their idolatry. And you say, well, Judah wasn't any better. Yeah, the Lord raised up Babylon. That is in the book of Habakkuk. You can see how all these were in that same time period, only that would be 100 years later when Judah would be taken into captivity, but the Lord would bring them back and settle them again in the land. Why? Because it was through Judah that God had purposed that his son should come the seed of David, the Lion of Judah. But the only reason Judah was spared and continued to exist versus Ephraim or Israel that was completely destroyed is because of that seed, which is Christ. And so in the message of condemnation, there is that message of hope. But it's in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for this time in your word. We never cease to be amazed at what we read when you're pleased to open our eyes, cause us to see your ears to hear, and that we would see that if you have spared us from judgment, it's not for anything in us, but for Christ's sake, and that our hope is in that one who was smitten and was torn was bruised and yet in three days was raised up that we who are his and for whom you have named us in that covenant of grace that we should live we don't take that lightly and so as we continue our time of worship may be entirely to the honor and glory of your blessed son the lord jesus christ in whose name i pray amen